The people are represented by their counsel, Mr. Walgren and Ms. Brazil. Dr. Rochelle Cooper once again is on the witness stand, and all 12 jurors and the five alternates are present as well. Good morning, everyone. To the jurors, good morning. Hopefully you had a good weekend, ladies and gentlemen, and you followed my orders, all of them. Dr. Cooper, good morning. Good morning. Do you acknowledge you are still under oath and that you are still sworn to tell the truth? Yes. Thank you. This will be a resumption of direct examination by Mr. Walgren. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Cooper. Good morning. Dr. Cooper, on Friday, uh, you described uh, your activities on June 25, 2009, uh, from the time of uh, approximately 1.13 thereafter uh, in your attempts to revive uh, Michael Jackson, the decedent in this case. Do you recall your testimony? Yes. Okay. And I believe where we left off, we had gone through some of the photographs of the trauma bay. Um, and you'd also indicated that you had had conversations with Dr. Murray uh, upon Mr. Jackson's initial arrival as well as throughout your attempts to revive Mr. Jackson. Is that accurate? That would be accurate. Okay. And throughout those conversations, what he indicated to you is that he had given Michael Jackson a total of four milligrams of lorazepam. Is that accurate? That's what I was told, yes. Okay. And no mention of propofol? No. That's correct? That is correct. I wanted to follow up just very briefly uh, what was Mark Peoples 48 for identification. Uh, maybe we dim the lights just for a moment. Please. Benson, thank you. Dr. Cooper, what, what is this item here to the right uh, of the equipment cabinet that has the pole and then a rectangular device on top of it? That is a small ventilator. Okay. And I don't believe I'd asked you on Friday, uh, what is this stand? This stand here to the left of the photograph has a pole and then two separate poles uh, coming up from that stand. Um, there are, those are two IV poles, and on them... The this on. These are um, sort of like small computers. They're pumps to control the rate of infusion if you had an IV bag attached to the pole. Okay, those are computerized infusion pumps? Yes. The con if you have an infusion line, uh, they can be programmed to control the rate of infusion into the patient? Correct. Okay. The lights can be on. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Now, in, in regard to your efforts to uh, revive Mr. Jackson, uh, you've described some of the, uh, the team members that were present. I believe it was 14 people uh, and additional individuals coming in and out. Is that accurate? That would be accurate. Okay. As far as uh, resuscitative drugs, was there a, a process of uh, different drugs that were, were given to Mr. Jackson during these procedures? There were. As I was managing the code, so our nurses, the residents, pharmacies, and cardiology are all used to running a code, so many drugs were sort of considered, um, for which I then would give the final order to pharmacy. Okay. What does um, that mean to run a code? What do you mean by that? I was the final sort of say. It was sort of my, because there are a lot of people asking, can we do this, should we do this, there needs to be a final say to, yes, execute this order for the nurse, for one, for pharmacy to prepare the drug and prepare the dose of the drug, but then also to tell the nurse to, yes, administer the drug. Okay, so when you say you were running the code, you were in charge of these efforts uh, yes. and in charge of the, the team of medical personnel? Yes. Okay. And you were aware that uh, 
the paramedics had given uh, a series of starter drugs to Mr. Jackson, both in the field and also during transport, correct? Correct. Okay. And while at UCLA, was, uh, were additional dosages of epinephrine given to Mr. Jackson? Yes. Okay. Was uh, sodium bicarbonate given to Mr. Jackson? Yes. Was vasopressin given to Mr. Jackson? Yes, it was. And what is that? It is another type of vasoconstrictive medicine, a different class of drug than epinephrine okay. that is given at times during a cardiac arrest. And the purpose is what? Our goal is to try and attempt to have the heart pump better to uh, constrict the blood vessels and achieve a better blood pressure to the brain and to actually restart someone's heart. Okay. And was dopamine given to Mr. Jackson? Yes, dopamine was given as a infusion, as a okay. drip. And for what purpose? Again, it's a drug that can increase the sort of the strength of the way the heart muscle contracts, as well as can um, increase blood pressure and increase heart rate. Okay. And again, during these efforts then, um, was a technician on site uh, doing physical chest compressions? Yes. Okay. And did that continue throughout this, um, throughout these efforts to revive Mr. Jackson? From the time of arrival, um, you know, no, I can't remember if it was actually when we do the, um, you know, so later on there's an aortic balloon pump, cardiology, I don't remember if we actually stopped compressions. In general, compressions are continuous and only stop briefly to check to see if there's a pulse or a response to therapy. Okay. So there are brief interruptions. Okay, and there's a technician actually assigned that responsibility to do two-handed chest compressions on the patient? There is. There's more than one. People get tired, so we rotate to make sure that compressions quality is adequate and maintained. Okay. And the, the care for Mr. Jackson, um, you indicated he arrived at about 1.13 and in fact was pronounced dead uh, at 2.26 p.m. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. So during that uh, hour and 13 minutes, uh, the care you described was pretty much continuous? Yes. Okay. And then these chest compressions from the various technicians at UCLA was basically uh, continuous more or less through this hour and 13 minute yes, uh, effort? Yes, Yes? That would be correct. Okay. And was there also a process by which Mr. Jackson was being, uh, or bagging was taking place? The respiratory therapist um, bagged the pa Mr. Jackson throughout the resuscitation. Okay, and what do you mean by uh, bagging? Um, Mr. Jackson had an endotracheal tube, so it was a tube from his mouth through basically the windpipe into the sort of what we call the trachea, just above the lungs. Um, that tip of that tube is then connected, there's a little connector, and there is what's called an ambu bag. And you physically squeeze that bag to deliver um, air, and in this case, oxygen, because the bag is then connected to an oxygen source. Okay. And that process, again, was continuous for this hour and 13 minutes? Throughout, yes. Okay. And there was a technician specifically assigned to that task? A respiratory therapist. And you've described in the various photographs the, uh, the monitoring equipment. Uh, was there cardiac monitoring taking place throughout? Continuously, yes. Okay. Uh, measuring, uh, well, what was being measured? Um, sort of a, an EKG rhythm strip, a heart rate, um, attempting to measure blood pressure if there was a palpable blood pressure. Um, respiratory rate is monitored, so it would actually record how many breaths we were delivering. Um, if there was enough perfusion that you could actually measure um, oxygen saturation, which is measured peripherally, that shows up on the monitor. That would be part of pulse ox uh, oximetry? That's a pulse oximeter, yes. Okay. And all of this monitoring was continuous? Throughout, yes. Okay. Now, during this uh, approximately hour and 13 minutes, did you ever uh, feel or note a spontaneous pulse on Mr. Jackson? I did not personally ever feel a pulse or confirm any pulse. Okay. At some point did you try to, uh, was there someone in the room indicate that they thought they felt a pulse? Um, I think it was at 121, so approximately eight minutes into the resuscitation, 
there was a report that someone, when we did a pulse check, reported a, that they felt a pulse. Okay. And did you then stop compressions and see if you could confirm that? When compressions are going, we could feel a pulse, but a spontaneous pulse without compressions, I did not appreciate. Around 1321, I said, you know, hold compressions, do we have a pulse? Someone reported feeling a pulse, at which point I attempted to confirm that. And the monitor still showed a slow agonal rhythm, which would not really be consistent with a regaining pulse. I then also confirmed the ultrasound, look at the heart to see if it was actually pumping in a manner that I thought was improved and did not. And I could not palpate a pulse to confirm. And so chest compressions were resumed okay. and so no other pulse was ever appreciated without compressions. Okay. So through your own uh, observations and the equipment you've referenced, um, you were not able to ascertain a pulse at that time? At any time. At any time. Correct? Correct. Is it common in these situations for people to uh, feel for a pulse and actually feel their own pulse and mistake it for the patients? During a, a code, it would not be uncommon for someone to think they felt a pulse, and that is why we always confirm. And that is why, with all the equipment available, you can confirm through multiple means? Yes. <laughs> now, then, at 226, uh, did you make uh, the determination to, again, pronounce Mr. Jackson dead? Yes. Okay. And that was actually the second time uh, that you'd made that determination, the first one being at 12.57 p.m. when the paramedics were out in the field with Mr. Jackson? That would be correct. Okay. And from that time of 12.57 p.m. to the time of 2.26 p.m., had uh, there been any notable change in Mr. Jackson's condition? No. Dr. Cooper, um, I note I notice in the uh, in the medical records um, the patient identifying labeling system uh, assigned to decedent Michael Jackson um, actually has a, a particular name, uh, and I'll read it: trauma W M zero two four one comma Gershwin G E R S H W I N. What is that reference? For circumstances such as a code um, or a, say, a trauma patient, something, a patient that's coming in that is critical in which we need to be able to act, access medications, get an immediate chest x-ray, and immediately obtain sort of lab data, we need a system of labeling, and there's not time to register the patient. So we have pre-made packets that include a doctor's note, a nurse's note or a code note, um, extra labels, stickers that can be placed on blood specimens, x-ray requests that are already labeled, um, so we can immediately begin to order treatments and link everything to that one record so okay. we don't make a mistake. So these are labels that are created prior to even the patient's arrival at the hospital? There are a series of packets that run in alphabetical order and the next packet up is Okay. Is and that's so that there's no delay in creating these labels and record keeping system uh, when the patients there waited to be treated on. Correct. Okay. And so uh, in the case of Michael Jackson, um, was the labeling system unique to Mr. Jackson? The medical record ID number is unique to the patient. Okay. Because it's an alphabetical system, there will likely be another trauma Gershwin okay. within a certain amount, but it will, each patient um, has their own unique identifying medical record number. Okay, and that number is reflected in all of the, uh, the medical records as well as your report in this case? Correct. Okay. Uh, may I approach the witness? witness may. I'm approaching with your handwritten notes. Is the label uh, depicted, for example, on the first page of your handwritten notes? Yes. Okay, and does that have uh, what I read previously, trauma WM0241, comma Gershwin, as well as the accompanying uh, medical record number? Yes, it does. Okay, and what is the medical record number that was assigned to uh, 
all the records and blood samples of Mr. Michael Jackson? Uh, three nine seven five nine four four. And there's a four, but okay. And the main sequence of numbers then is the three nine seven dash five nine dash four four. That's correct. Okay, and again, that's unique to all the specimens and the records uh, for Michael Jackson. Yes. And was that medical record identifying information uh, attached to blood samples that were collected from Mr. Jackson for subsequent analysis? Yes, they would be. Okay. Now, when Mr. Jackson arrived, uh, or following his arrival at the hospital and your observations of him and his body, uh, did you notice a condom catheter on his, on his body? Yes. And what is that? Um, it's one type of urinary collection device um, in which there is a condom. And at the tip of the condom, there's a hole that's connected to a tube, and that tube connects to sort of a collection bag system it's a, to collect urine. OK. And from a medical standpoint, in a, in a surgical room, uh, are, are urinary collection devices in the form of catheters used uh, because the patient is essentially unconscious and will need a collection uh, device to collect the urine. There are, yes, there are a number of urinary collection devices, and a catheter would be common in the OR and in other areas of the hospital. Okay. Now, at the time that you observed that, you knew that Mr. Jackson had been coming from a home, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, did that strike you as odd to see this condom catheter on the patient? I thought it was unusual. A condom catheter would not be uncommon in someone who has problems with incontinence, but it seemed unusual for a 50-year-old male who was reportedly healthy. Okay. Yes. Now, following the pronouncement of death, Dr. Cooper, um, did you ever uh, consult with or request uh, Dr. Murray to sign a death certificate? No. Okay. Is that something you would have done in this situation? No. Why not? Mr. Jackson was my patient, and I didn't really have an explanation for why he was dead. Okay. And it therefore, in my mind, was a coroner's case. He when you say it was a coroner's case, you mean that it will be referenced to the coroner's office for uh, an autopsy and investigation? Correct. Okay. So you never asked Dr. Murray to sign any death certificate? No. It was not a discussion. Okay. That conversation never even took place? No. These are double negatives. Did that conversation ever take place with Conrad Murray? That would be a correct. I did not have a conversation with Dr. Murray about the death certificate, no. And it wouldn't be his decision. It would be yours. Is that accurate? That would be accurate. Now, was a, again, following pronouncement of death, uh, was a social worker team uh, uh, gathered together um, to uh, be available to the family and the children if necessary? The social work team had actually been gathered even before the pronouncement. Um, social work was one of the team members who was notified of the code and was there at the outset, um, in part to help me assist contacting family, although that was apparently done through like, someone, for, through Mr. Jackson's people. But, um, and I'm not sure when I became aware his children were there, but there was a social work, there was someone with the children separately, yes. Okay. And, but this social worker team, uh, was that assembled as part of the standard UCLA protocol in this type of situation? Yes. Okay. Uh, That was not Conrad Murray's doing. In other words, he's not the one that recommended or gathered together a social worker team, is he? No. We would typically call a social worker when we have a code. Okay. And they are activated and... As a standard protocol. As is protocol. Okay. Now, at some point, did you learn uh, or were you told that the children had been notified of their father's death uh, following pronouncement? Yes, I was told. 
And did you then personally go to uh, check on the children or see if there's any information you could provide? I did go to check on the children at that time. And did you, did you see the children? Uh, I did, yes. And what were they doing? They were crying. They were fairly hysterical, being comforted by someone who was referred to as their nurse. And did you hear anything being said by the, one of the children at that time? Uh, there were... I, the objections sustained, calls for hearsay, absent for the foundation, partial answers sustained, disregard. Well, did you attempt to uh, speak to the children at that time? Zero. Sustained. Uh, you described them as hysterical and crying? Yes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Walker, thank you. Cross-examination by the defense. Mr. Flanagan. Dr. Cooper, have you uh, reviewed any documents prior to your testimony in this case? I've reviewed my medical chart, and I did review the preliminary hearing testimony. Reviewed your testimony at the preliminary hearing? Yes. Uh, is there anything that you would like to correct regarding your preliminary hearing testimony? There probably are things I would clarify if I had the testimony to go through page by page now. But nothing you'd actually correct as being wrong? I think there may be statements I made that may have oversimplified. But nothing absolutely wrong? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, what, as you sit here now, what is your best estimate as to the time of death, Michael Jackson? I don't know when his actual time of death was. I know the pronouncement I made based on the information I had at the time I was involved in the radio call. So the, at 1257, you were acquainted with all of the details from the paramedics, and you formed the opinion at that time he was dead. Yes. And you wouldn't authorize a call to be made if you thought there was any chance of saving an individual, would you? No. So at 1257, you knew in this case nothing could be done. Based on the information I had, I felt a pronouncement of death in the field was appropriate at that time, yes. Okay. The only reason that anything was done after 1257 it's because Dr. Murray insisted that you don't give up. Is that correct? I don't know if I would word it that way, because as the base physician, I could override and still pronounce. However, there was a physician on scene, and then I had con potentially conflicting information. And so, yes, I did authorize and allow Dr. Murray to assume control and then bring the patient to the emergency department or the local emergency department. So, yes. But for Dr. Murray, he doesn't even get brought to UCLA Medical Center, does he? That would be a correct statement. Excuse? Excuse? That would be a correct statement, yes. And uh, you basically felt when uh, Michael Jackson was brought in, everything's going to be futile anyway. Is that correct? My assessment when he arrived was that he was clinically dead. And given it had been now from the time that I had as the prior time arrest from the code in the base station form, it was about an hour, such that the resuscitation efforts would likely be futile, yes. But if you thought there was a chance in the, when he was in the field, you wouldn't have authorized them to 
to call it, would you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm sort of saying something that seems to be conflicting, but I made a call based on the radio information that I had, which was from the paramedic report, and I did at that time he was clinically dead. I felt comfortable pronouncing him. And when you you wouldn't be comfortable pr uh, uh, pronouncing him dead unless you thought there was no chance, isn't that correct? At the time I made the pronouncement in the field, I made a decision based on the information I had, yes. And the information that you had in the field proved out to be the same when they brought him in. Is that correct? That's correct. And so the minute he comes in the hospital, there's no chance, is there? In retrospect? After my evaluation and knowing everything I know now, right. that would be correct. And when you looked at him, when they, they brought him into the hospital and you, re, you actually got to use your own senses and eyes, you knew right then there's no chance, didn't you? When, I, when Mr. Jackson was sent to the hospital, Dr. Murray reported that he had felt a faint pulse, which conflicted the information from the paramedics. I therefore, yes, decided that it was going to be my decision to make sure that everything had been done, was done correctly, was not misrecorded, and that with effort there was no change. So, yes, I used my determination of what I saw to make a final decision. And that confirmed the original decision that you'd made at 1257, didn't it? Yes. Uh, at 1257, Based upon the information you have, would you have any idea as to the time of uh, death? No. Now, you went to medical school, and then you became a resident, you did an internship. Did you ever become an anesthesiologist? No. Uh, do you use propofol? I do use propofol in my practice in the emergency department, yes. Is there any special certification that you have to have to use propofol? Yes. What is that? At UCLA, you need to have privileges first to perform procedural sedation, as well as specifically privileges to administer propofol. So you're, are, you're certified to use propofol for uh, anesthesia purposes? No, I am certified to use propofol in the emergency department for procedural sedation and for deep sedation of patients who are intubated. I are do not perform anesthesia. Are you certified to use propofol for conscious sedation? Um, we use the term procedural sedation. And yes, I am. I do have privileges to perform procedural sedation using propofol at UCLA. Have you ever practiced in a medical office? No. Uh, I take it you've probably never made house calls either. No, I am an emergency medicine physician. I work in the emergency department. And so whenever you're practicing medicine, you're always in the confines of a, of a medical room or a hospital setting. Of a hospital emergency department, that would be correct. Uh, you use the term procedural sedation. How do, does that differ from the term conscious sedation? Conscious sedation is sort of an oxymoron. Right? You're not conscious and potentially sort of very sedated and unconscious. So we use the term procedural sedation for the reasons that we would be, you know, using these medications. Well, in conscious sedation, when you sedate the individual, the, cap the individual is capable of being aroused, isn't he? Sedation is a continuum from being completely alert to being comatose. So you've never even, you're not even familiar with the term conscious sedation. Objection sustains the testimony. The objection sustained of you of the earlier answers. Okay. Uh, is there a difference in being certified for conscious sedation versus certified for anesthesia in the use of propofol? So in terms, there is a difference in having privileges to perform procedural sedation 
than having privileges to perform anesthesia, yes. And there's different requirements for, for monitoring with respect to these, the differences with respect to anesthesia and conscious sedation, isn't there? For procedural sedation, there are very specific requirements for monitoring. I am not an anesthesiologist. I do not work in the operating room. I do not perform anesthesia, and so I'm not qualified to tell you what their requirements are. Are you uh, familiar with blood levels, toxicology numbers, that will be achieved upon uh, use of certain amounts of medication? Jackson no. The honor of expertise. Sustained, partial answer stricken. Please disregard it. So if, uh, if a person's given a certain amount, a certain amount of propofol, would you be able to tell what their blood level was? Objection. Beyond the scope. Beyond the Same. Now, in your use of propofol, and for procedural sedation, what, what types of, uh, what, what amounts of propofol do you use? It will vary case by case. Okay. It depends on the individual size? Yes. And does it also depend upon the level of sedation you're trying to achieve? In general, once I make a determination I'm going to form procedural sedation, I will choose a dose that will, in general, make patients comfortable and not be completely alert or aware so that we can perform whatever painful procedure needs to be done. So I, in general, I'm, our goal is to have about the same level of sedation for most procedures. Okay, do you ever vary the, the uh, sedation level for a procedure that you do? Yes, probably. Uh, have you ever used uh, propofol for, uh, as a pre-med prior to doing a procedure? No. Uh, now, if I were to give you a hypothetical that that 25 milligrams of propofol was slowly infused over a three to five minute period at 1040 with 25, with, with also two and a half milliliters of lidocaine. <clears throat> would you have an opinion as to how long that would last? It would depend on the patient. On a patient, uh, say, the size of Michael Jackson, about 135 pounds. And he received no other medication. Right. I would think it would be, in my practice for procedural sedation, I couldn't imagine I would give a dose of 25 milligrams to an otherwise healthy 60-kilogram male and give it over three to five minutes because I would not expect that would produce any level of sedation for me to achieve the procedure I wanted. And, but if it did achieve sedation, I would expect, if he didn't have any medical problems, seven to 10 minutes, it would probably be worn off. When you say worn off, what do you mean? I would expect that I would not have, if I had achieved sedation, I would suspect that sedation would be completely resolved within about seven to 10 minutes. You, would that mean that the propofol would basically be out of the bloodstream? I don't think that that would mean that the propofol would be completely metabolized, but the sedative effects that I would be concerned about and the sedation level would not be a concern at 10 minutes. How long do you think it would take for it to be completely metabolized? Objection beyond the scope, beyond the area of expertise. Same. Now, uh, when you say you're not, you're not even sure that that would achieve, if there's no other drugs in the system, that there's no, that that would not, might not achieve a, a level of sedation. Is that correct? That's correct. 
So is what you're saying is that 25 milligrams is a very small amount of propofol to give a patient? A 60 kilogram male, if I wanted to achieve sedation so that I could perform a painful procedure, yeah. 25 milligrams would not be a sufficient dose in most patients. But it might be enough to put a person to, to sleep? I don't suspect so, but I don't know. I do not use the medication in those types of doses. Okay. Now, Dr. Murray informed you that he had given lorazepam. Is that correct? That is correct. And he told you four milligrams? He reported he gave him two milligrams, and then at a later time gave him another two milligrams and at the time of the just before the arrest. Did he tell you what time he gave the lorazepam? I did not get a specific time, no. Did you ask for a specific time? I did not explicitly ask for the exact time. Would the time of the lorazepam matter? What do you mean, would it matter? Well, uh... Would it matter as to whether or not it's having an effect on his, uh, his body at that time? At the time Mr. Jackson was my patient, he had, was already had been dead for some time. The dose of the medication was reported to me as being the last dose was given at the time that Dr. Murray reported he witnessed the arrest. Okay, when, well, when you asked about the medications, were you trying to determine a cause of death, or were you trying to get information necessary for purposes of treating Mr. Jackson? The information I had about the lorazepam was provided by Dr. Murray when I asked what happened and was trying to obtain both the patient's medical history as well as the events surrounding the arrest so that I could treat Mr. Jackson. So you wanted to know the information for purposes of treatment? Yes. Mr. Jackson was my patient, and I was attempting to treat him, yes. Okay, you were not looking to determine a cause of death? I was looking to determine what may have caused the death, just the same reason I asked about past medical history and medical complaints, because I used that in my decision-making in term determining if there was something that was or was not done during the resuscitation that I should do. Well, the, when he's treated with lorazepam, would it make a difference whether it was treated whether he was given the lorazepam that morning or the following or the previous day? Matter in terms of, I'm not sure what you mean in terms of matter. Why did you ask what medications were there? I was attempting to resuscitate Mr. Jackson. So in my mind, as I am running the code, I am thinking of all the causes for why a 50-year-old male would be suddenly dead so that I can then decide what treatments we should consider. Okay, the, so the medications are, are important to know, but the time of those medications is important also, isn't it? Most of the history would be important. That is why I asked Dr. Burry for information. But you never asked him about the time, did you? No. No. Okay, so... If he gave lorazepam the day before, it wouldn't matter at all, would it? I don't know what he did the day before. I became Mr. Jackson's doctor when he arrived in the emergency department, Your and I was asking for a medical history. No, I'm going to allow the witness to finish. Okay. The objection's overruled. Okay. You may answer it, please. Okay. The medical note that I wrote is the story of the care that I provided and the information that I had at the time. I asked Dr. Murray standard, simple questions uh, that I would ask of any medical professional if I was taking care of their patient. You found, you determined what the medication was that had been given. Is it your testimony that the time that it is given did not matter? I don't believe I said that that was my testimony, no. No, you didn't. I'm asking you if it did matter. It may have mattered, yes. At the time I was taking care of Mr. Jackson, I didn't know why he was dead, so I wasn't sure what mattered. That's why I asked for all of the information that I could have. But you didn't ask about the time, did you? No, I did not explicitly ask for the time. And what I'm asking you, does the time matter? You have to ask and answer it about three times. Overruled. You may answer the question. Okay. At the time I spoke with Dr. Murray, his report to me was he gave 
at the last dose, he gave two milligrams of lorazepam, observed the arrest, instituted a CPR, and called 911. In my mind, I made the assumption, which may be incorrect, that that was all proximate, that he had just received the medicine, he witnessed the arrest, and then the patient shortly became my patient. Now, you've never testified before that he gave it and then witnessed the arrest right after he gave it, did you? I believe I did testify to that, and I believe that's what my chart reflects. Well, if, if Dr. Murray gave lorazepam two milligrams at 2 o'clock and two milligrams at 5 a.m., would you still expect that to be in the Michael Jackson system at 12? And when you say in the system, I don't know what would be completely cleared in terms of metabolites. But a dose of medication at 5 a.m., I would not expect to have as much of an effect at noon. We're not communicating very well, doctor. Okay. I, I, I asked you a question. At 2 a.m., 5 a.m., 2 milligrams each time, would you still expect that to be in his blood at 12 o'clock? Beyond our barrier of expertise. If you know or not. I do not know when the drug would completely clear his bloodstream. Overruled. Are you familiar with the half-life of lorazepam? The half-life of benzodiazepines can vary greatly depending on the patient and, and on how many doses they've had, on whether they're a routine user. I'm not talking about benzodiazepines in general. I'm asking you if you're aware of the half-life of lorazepam. I cannot give you the exact half-life of lorazepam currently, no. If it was given 2 milligrams at, at 2 and 2 milligrams at 5, would you expect any lorazepam to be in his bloodstream? Objection. Same objection. Sustain. You, you're, you're not familiar with, with that? Objection. Same objection. Overall, is that a fair statement that you're not familiar with that particular issue? I'm not too many variables or whatever else is going on. I'm, it seems to be still related to asking about something in the blood level and the blood system, and I am not qualified to answer that. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, if uh, Michael Jackson was slowly infused with 25 milligrams of uh, propofol at 10:40. Would that still be in his blood system at 12? Objection, same. same objection beyond the scope, beyond our area of well, I think she's testified she's familiar with this. I will rule the objection if you're able to answer that type of hypothetical. Okay. I think you were asking if something was still in his blood system, and as I said, I do not know the metabolism of the blood, but I would not expect him to still be sedated from that two well, hours you, later, if that's the question. Well, you know it wouldn't be in his system, don't you? What, what type of training have you had with respect to the administration of propofol? I have uh, been to courses on procedural sedation. I perform procedural sedation. We routinely review articles at the use of procedural sedation. Okay. And if you were going to do procedural sedation on a 135-pound person, 60 kilograms, how much propofol would you use to sedate them? So this is an otherwise healthy person who I've already decided is safe to give procedural sedation to? Yes. And I've not given them any other medication? Yes. About a milligram per kilogram would probably be my starting dose. Okay. And that if you gave him a milligram per kilogram, in this case that would be 60 milligrams, correct? Correct. How long would it keep him asleep? If that was sufficient to sedate him, I would suspect the level of sedation would wear off in about 10 minutes. Okay. How long would it continue to be in the system? Objection vague. Same objection. The same ruling on, on foundation ground. Sustained. How long would it be detectable in a blood sample? Objection. Sustained. We're going to move to another subject area. Thank you. 350, 352. Would it be uh, your testimony that you're not? Well, let me ask you about this problem. Had Dr. Murray told you 
that he had given 25 milligrams of propofol at 1040, sometime between 1040 and 1050. Would that have altered your treatment of Michael Jackson? No. Would that have altered the, the result that happened to Michael Jackson? As I said, Mr. Jackson died long before he became a patient that I was personally responsible for. So no, knowing even more information, it is unlikely with that information I would have been able to do something different that would have changed the outcome. And were, when you asked about the medications, were you primarily interested in medications that might be in the system at that point in time? I was interested in all of the available med medical history so that I could best decide how to treat Mr. Jackson. But there was no chance of treating Mr. Jackson, was there, successfully? From what I know now, no. But at the time, I had a 50-year-old male who was dead. And in my mind, there are many other conditions that may cause a cardiac arrest. I therefore asked information on the history so that I could either consider those diagnoses or other treatments. Uh, in your use of uh, propofol, you ever had a patient with slurred speech? Someone who's. I'm going to sustain the objection. Uh, 350, 352. Strike out the answer, please. Uh, did you see uh, or listen at any point in time in the last week? Uh, Michael Jackson's speech on May 10th at 9.05 a.m. Staying 350, 352. Can we approach on that one, Your Honor? Yes. 